I want you to hear from God today. As I speak, I don't take this lightly. This is the most important part of the service. And um, I want you to hear what God is saying, what God is saying today. Uh, I'm going to continue. This is the last message in my series, Cancel Culture. Cancel Culture. If you're not familiar with cancel culture, then then let me explain it to you. What is cancel culture? In our society, there's a lot of things that, well, if, if you say something, then and it goes against the grain. Uh, it's not what someone wants to hear. It offends people. Then, it's, then you're just muted. You're canceled. Um, and I'm against muting anybody, canceling anybody. I don't care if you spew hatred and you are a bigot or a racist or whatever. I want you to be able to talk. I want you to be able to say what you want to say because, see, here's the problem. When we silence one group, then we risk ourselves being silenced. So we want people not to cancel people. We want people to have their right, you know, to, to talk. Well, that's my, that's my uh, thought on the issue. Uh, some may differ, but that's fine. The reason I don't, I, I believe that is because one day they're going to try to cancel the Word of God. So I say, let's just all say what we want to say. And you know what? It lets people know where you stand. So if you spew hatred, hatred is not just some rhetoric. It's out of your heart. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, you know, I don't agree with all this cancel culture stuff. But if and since we do live in a time where everything has been canceled, I want to cancel some things myself. And I would like to cancel this false Christianity called cultural Christianity. It's a check the box Christianity. I understand I can't do a whole lot in this world as a world impact. I'm a nobody. I don't have much of a voice. I Holly messes around and pretends, she, she jokes around and says I'm way cross famous. <laughs> uh, and uh, so whatever. Uh, I understand who I am and um, I am going to be who I am. And I know I can't change a lot of things in this world, but for this church, I am the pastor. And I care for you. And I care about you and your family. And I don't want you to live life with a false sense of security that everything is okay. When for a lot, everything is not okay. I don't want you to go through life and think, well, because I do this and I do that, I am a Christian because there are chances, chance, there's a chance that you not, may not be a Christian, a born again believer, but you may just be a cultural Christian, one who identifies as a Christian, but does not adhere to the faith, to the word of God. Um, you, it, it's one who labels themselves as a Christian, but it's simply because of your background. Your family raised you as a Christian or whatever that means, raised you up in church, but you've never been raised up in Christ. You're a cultural Christian. Uh, you're a Christian because of your background. You're a Christian because you're not a Muslim or you're not a Buddhist. So, well, I must be a Christian and you're far from it because if that's the only thing causing you to be a Christian and that's the only reason you're a Christian, you are not a Christian. You're a check the box Christian. You're a Christian because you're not this or you're not that, but you're not a Christian because the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your life. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm just a Christian. Christianity to you is a club. You want to be part of a club. This isn't a club. Well, I go to church and I do these good things and I, I, I give in the offering. Pastor, when you talk about giving, I give of the offering. Yes, but have you given your life to him? You know him to be Savior, but have you submitted to the Lordship of Jesus? You know that he can save, but has he saved you? Church attendance, charitable giving, it's just a list of good things that we do. You, you, you lump it right up with when, the, when you give to the ASPCA. You know what that is? 
the little doggies at Christmas time who don't have a home. And you give to them as Sarah McLaughlin sings that song. Uh, what's that song? In the arms of an angel. <laughs> well, you know, I want to give too, and I don't even like dogs. But you, but you lump yourself up with church attendance and, and giving to just saving the planet or taking care of animals. You're a cultural Christian. Uh, and these good deeds make you feel better about yourself. You ignore and downplay repentance. Hey, we talked about repentance last week, didn't we? You deny inspiration of Scripture. Well, let me tell you how, surely nobody in here says this isn't God's Word, but let me make it easier for maybe you to understand. You started out liking this part, but not liking this part, but now you say, this is God-inspired this isn't. No, friend, all of this is. The part you like and the part you don't like. The part that's hard to swallow and the part that's not hard to swallow. It's all God's Word. You focus on the love of Jesus and His acceptance, uh, ignoring the fact that there is a real hell. Tolerating sin almost to the point of celebrating it. This makes me sick uh, when I hear people uh, and you can say it in a, in a uh, there is an accurate way to, to say this and with this accurate thought, but then there's also this thought of saying this thing which sounds good, but when you're trying to uh, make the sin of your children or the sin of your family or uh, the sin of the pet sin that you have that instead of killing it, you have snuggled up to it and instead of realizing it's poisonous, you've made it a pet. It's, it's saying things like this, well, sin is sin, Yeah, sin is sin. But let me ask you a question. Do you hate sin? Because for too many people, we say sin is sin, and what we're really saying is what I do is okay. Or what my friend does. I don't want to hurt their feelings. It's okay. Or what my son does. Or what my daughter does. Sin, sin. Don't say nothing about it. What we're really saying is, don't get up and preach about it, preacher, if there's something in your life you struggle with. Well, friend, if that's the way you think, then I might as well, all of us, just go home and sit down and not come back to church because there's no one in here who doesn't struggle with something. There's no one in here that's got it all right. But let me tell you what's the difference between me and some of you. I hate my sin. I hate every bit of it. I hate all sin. I hate homosexuality. I hate lying. I hate stealing. I hate gluttony. I hate pornography. I hate drunkenness. I hate sin. Is sin sin? Yes. And it'll take us to a sinner's hell. But thank God for the grace and the mercy and the blood of Jesus. Because without that, we have no hope. Without that, we have no reason for being here. I hate sin. And let me tell you something. You got to get it down in your, your heart and in your soul and in your spirit. I hate sin. I hate what sin does. Let me tell you, I hate what sin does because I've seen it. Ruin families, destroy testimonies, divide homes, turn father against son, son against father. I hate sin. I've seen it drag people out of this church. Now I can, I can play with you or I can be real with you. What you want. I've seen, it, I've seen it lasso people out of this church and drag them out. I'm not okay with it. You, you want a preacher that's okay with it, that he, uh, you'll find a preacher that don't care. But this preacher, he cares. And I've seen it lasso and arrest people and drag them out of this place, separate them from their families, separate from them from their husbands, from their wives. 
from being the father that they're supposed to be? And you think I'm going to play with sin? You think I'm going to just ease over it and glaze over it? This ain't no donut. I'm telling you right now, this is serious. Sin is poisonous. Sin steals, it steals, it kills, it destroys, it puts wedges between us and God. It brings condemnation and guilt and shame. Sin is nothing to play with. I hate sin. We talk about God, but little, nothing to do about Jesus. They can stand and say the pledge of allegiance uh, in God, uh, one nation under God. Well, who is God? Who is God? Friend, there is no way to God except through his son, Jesus. They love talking about God, but they have nothing to do with Jesus. They believe you can do enough religious stuff to gain a source of well, sense of well-being without any true devotion to Christ. And they don't want to hear any teaching about obedience and sacrifice. Yes, amen. But that's what we're going to talk about today. Obedience and sacrifice. If you want to know who you are today, whether I'm a cultural Christian or a born-again believer, you can answer that question by answering this question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Not who he is to your mama, because you and your mama ain't going to stand before God together. It's going to be you. Not who he is to your dad, but who is God to you? Who is Jesus to you? We've been coming out of the book of James, but today I want to come out of the book of John. I love John's account of the gospel. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're synoptic, synonymous. They write as simply, they are just writing what they seen. And it's almost the same. The gospel according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But then you've got John who tells you why he wrote his epistle. The gospel according to John. He tells you why he wrote it. He wrote it. It's in the very back of, the, of his letter or of his, his epistle. It says, I wrote this so that people would believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God. And he said this, he said, if I was to write everything that Jesus had done, there wouldn't be enough books or volumes of books to contain it all. But I wrote what I wrote so that you would believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Well, in John chapter six, there are two miracles that take place. The first miracle is this miracle where a crowd is following Jesus. Think about it like this crowd here today, but a lot larger. Uh, 5,000, not including women and children. So somewhere over 5,000, probably seven or 8,000 people, if not more than that. They are following Jesus. Jesus actually calls them disciples. The reason they're following Jesus and listening to Jesus is because <clears throat> Jesus has been performing miracles, healing the sick, so that garners a crowd. And Jesus asked his disciples as the crowd is standing around him, it's getting late, and he asked the disciples a question. And you got to understand when you read the Bible that when Jesus asks a question, he already knows the answer. He asked them a question. He said, man, th these people are hungry. We got anything to feed them? It's getting late. We ought to feed these people something. You know, the disciples were like, oh, I don't know. One disciple, I don't, I don't remember who he was. I don't even know if the, if, if, uh, if, I don't know if even the Bible tells us who it is. Not sure. Can't remember. But he says, hey, there's a boy over here. He's got five pieces of bread. Five, 
5,000 people now. Five pieces of bread and two fish. Jesus says, good. Give me the bread. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and gives thanks. And then they go around this crowd and they start handing out John chapter 6, if you want to follow along. It starts handing out this bread. Five, two fish. And they start handing this fish and this bread out. And the more they give, the more's in the basket. Could you imagine that? He, they hand out, they went through the first 10, 15, or 20 people. And if I was a disciple, I'd be like, And, they, and I'm sure that's what happened. And they're giving it out, handing it out. The more they give, the more's in the basket. And in fact, in fact, and this is just a picture of how, who Jesus is. In fact, they gave and they gave and they fed all these people. And then after they had fed all the people, there was some left over. More than enough. I serve a more than enough Jesus. Oh, and so... They go to bed full, and it's an amazing miracle. They go to sleep, Jesus not so much. Jesus doesn't go to sleep. That night, he's walking on the water. You ought to read it. That same night, he walks on the water to the disciples. They're in the boat. He gets in the boat with them. The storm calms down, and they get to where they're going. Well, these people who've ate this bread wake up, and you know what? They wake up hungry. They wake up hungry. They just had an amazing miracle. God just fed them these fish sandwiches. It's amazing. But they wake up the next morning and they are hungry. And that is very important. They wake up hungry. Jesus never does anything by mistake. There was a purpose of what Jesus did. Jesus has gone now into the synagogue, and these people wake up. They're hungry. They look for Jesus and his disciples, and they're not there. They say, we got to find Jesus. They wind up finding Jesus. They said, Jesus, we've been looking for you. Verse 26, John chapter 6. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, you are looking for me. You're looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Amen. This is so important. You're looking for me because you want some more bread. That's what he's saying. He's in the synagogue getting ready to preach and teach. And here's this crowd of people rubbing their stomachs because they're hungry. And they said, Lord, we've been looking for you. Maybe they didn't say, Lord, we've been looking for you like that. But Lord, we have been looking for you. Where you been? And he said, you ain't been looking for me. You want what I can give you. You want to hang out with me because you like my bread. You like my fish, but you don't like me. And in fact, I'm, I'm fixing to say some things that you ain't going to like. You, you're not looking for me, he said. You're looking for my bread. Uh, let's read it. We got time. We got time. Jesus replied, this, well, verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life. Hmm? which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Jesus is talking about himself, by the way. What can we do to perform the works of God, they ask. What work shall we do? Oh, you better listen to this. Listen to this. This is good news. What work should I do then? And Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. They don't get it. They still think he's just a just someone who can do some miracles. They don't understand. They don't understand what's going on. He said, you got to believe on the one he has sent. And then verse 30, look what it says. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see 
and believe you. They asked, what are you going to perform? Hmm. What are you going to perform? Verse 31, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're going back to the story of the Israelites, their forefathers, who were in Egyptian bondage. Old Testament stuff. They were in Egyptian bondage. They come out of Egyptian bondage. They're in the wilderness, and they're hungry, and God gives them manna from heaven. And he said, they said, we remember our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said unto them, truly, I tell you. Next verse, Billy. For Jesus said, truly, I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but God gave you this bread from heaven. And you know what? They didn't like it. Can you imagine? Here's Israelite, the Israelites are in Egyptian bondage, or they're out of Egyptian bondage. They're in a wilderness now. They're just roaming to and fro. They're not in bondage, but they're hungry. And God begins to send miracle bread down from heaven. Wow. What a miracle, right? He'd done a lot of miracles for them, these Israelites. He, he gave them bread from heaven. He made sure their shoes didn't wear out. Uh, he was a cloud by day to keep them from being sunburnt. He was a fire by night to give them heat and to guide them as they were walking. It was amazing how God took care of them. But did you know what? They got tired of the manna. So you can't have just a little bit of God or the part of God that you like. See, these people, they liked the Jesus that made sure they had enough to eat. Jesus said unto them, truly, I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, here we go. Then they said, sir, Give us this bread. Give us some more of this bread then. Some of that bread. I like that bread. Give us some more of that bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread. The first of the seven I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. Mm, I'm about to preach now. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. See, the difference here is bread for a moment or bread for a life. Bread for just to get you by or bread that'll last for eternity. I don't care what you pop, what you smoke, what you drink, what you shoot up, what you snort, what you lay with or what you play with. Friend, it'll only last for a moment. Sin is only pleasurable for a season. But I tapped into some bread one day. I tasted and seen that the Lord is good and I've never been hungry and I'm never thirst again. Am I preaching right now? Am I saying anything to anybody right now? You're looking at me like, like, like I'm crazy and lost my mind and you would be right. I am crazy and I have lost my mind. The Bible says those who lose their life will find life but those who try to save their life will lose their life. I have given my life totally to Jesus Christ. We focus on the temporary, that which just lasts for a moment. And they said, you're hung up on the bread that you eat, and you woke up this morning, and you're hungry. But I want you to understand that the miracle is not me giving you bread. I am the miracle. I am the bread. I am life. Jesus told him, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever thirst again. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 4. Same thing. A woman at the well. They're headed to Samaria, but he's got to go this way because there's a woman at the well who's empty and dry, thirsty. 
and hungry. Shame to her family, living in guilt and condemnation. And Jesus meets her at the well. And he says, give me something to drink. She said, do you know who I am? I'm a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans don't have any, any we don't have to talk to each other. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God. It, if you knew the gift of God that was standing right here, you would ask me to give you water. And I would add from my well, I'd give you water and you would never thirst again. Uh, Jesus said, I am the bread. I am the water. Come unto me, all you who are thirsty. And I'll give you something to drink. How's it working for you? How's it going? You who deny Jesus, you just like what Jesus can do for you. How's it working? You want the bread, but you don't want the bread of life. You want to feel good about yourself, but at the end of the day, you really don't feel good about yourself. You're trying to feel good about yourself. You're trying to do good things. You're going to all the right classes, and you're going counseling. You got me time. Hanging out with the guys, hanging out with the girls. You're busy. You, do, you got some charitable clubs. You're doing some good things. Hmm. but your goodness is as filthy rags. And if you think you can stand before God and present your good things you've done and think God is going to be, wow, doggone it. I mean, you lived a good life. You are deceived. You are fooled. God gave his son Jesus he who knew no sin, to become sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God. You are the woman at the well. You are the crowd that said, I want the bread, but I don't know about the bread of life. You are the one. I am the, the one on, on, on the road that's beaten, broken, busted, disgusted, lost everything, has no hope, and somebody came by the way and got me up, cleaned me up, washed me off, put me a place to stay. I'm that person. I have no hope without Jesus. I'm blind until Jesus opened my eyes. I'm lost until Jesus found me. That's who I am. That's my story, my song, the why I'm preaching. The, the, the reason I feel like I feel is because I know what I know. And I know in whom I have believed that he who has saved me will keep me. I am persuaded of this. I know who I was and I know who I am today. And I'm going to tell everybody about what Jesus Christ has done for me. He said, I'm the bread of life. And no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. will never be thirsty. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. Are you listening to me, church? Will have eternal life. I will raise him up on that last day. Therefore, the Jews started complaining. Because he said, I'm the bread of life. They started complaining. I can't believe that he said he's the bread of life. Did you hear what he said? He said he came down from heaven. And then they begin to say, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Isn't this Joseph's son? How can he say he has come from heaven? This is Joseph's boy. You reading it? It's the next verse, actually. This is Joseph's boy, Mary's boy. How can he say, I've come down from heaven? And then Jesus answered them, shut up. 
Oh, it said stop. He said, he said, stop complaining. But you know, he said, would y'all shut up? <laughs> Be quiet. Stop talking. And I love this. And I want to be theologically correct and accurate in what I'm about to say. And, but it is just what it says. He says, stop complaining. Stop talking about it. Where'd that go? Thank you. <laughs> really? Come on, bro. I'm already having a hard enough time up here. Don't play games with me. Jesus answers him and says, stop complaining among yourselves. Verse 44, next verse. You can't even come to me unless my father draw you. See here, they're intellectually trying to get it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. One, one says, wait a minute, hold on. Now he did not come from heaven. He did not come from heaven because we know his mama and we know his daddy. Oh yeah, that's true. I forgot. He's Jesus of Nazareth. That's right. Nothing good can come from Nazareth. He, they're trying to intellectually understand it. And he said, eat, eat the bread. He's bread? He's not bread. What's he talking about? The bread of life. Well, he's not, I don't get what's going on. He's not, he's, he's just, I mean, yeah, he done some miracles. And then Jesus says, hush, don't worry about it anyway. Because you can't come to me unless the Father draw you. You're trying to figure it out. Just hush. You don't understand it. You don't believe it. You won't understand it. And you won't believe it unless God draws you. Unless he opened your eyes. It's a work of grace. It's a work of mercy. You won't understand it. You can't comprehend it. Unless my father draws you, leads you, brings you. And I will raise him up on that last day. And then he begins to say some weird things. Like what, pastor? Jesus begins to say, the bread is my flesh. And unless you eat of my flesh, listen to me, and drink of my blood, my blood which is true drink, in my flesh, which is true bread, unless you eat of me and drink of me, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And there again, is Jesus a cannibalist? They don't understand. That's what they're thinking. Drinking blood, eating my flesh. And the Bible says, they said, this is a hard thing. Verse 60. This is a hard thing. I don't get it, and I can't accept it. Therefore, many of his disciples heard this, and they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? I don't know, accept here? <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> we got to get that Bible straightened out up there. I don't know. I can't look at one more word that's bound together like that. And it ain't Billy's problem. It's the program's problem. Ah, that doesn't mind. Does that bother y'all as much as it bothers me? I see some of y'all trying to sound that out. Except to her. Except to her. <laughs> so, who can accept it? This is a hard teaching. And you know what they begin to do? The disciples. They were called disciples. This group of people begin to leave. Verse 66 says, from that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. And then Jesus said to the 12, the, the, the 12 disciples, y'all want to leave too? I want to be like Jesus. All of, all of it. 
in the flipping tables part too. <laughs> and this part where he says, okay, they're leaving. Y'all want to go? If you want to go, just go on now. Hit the road. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. <laughs> go. That's what he's saying. That's what he said. If you want to leave, go. And you know what Simon Peter said? Peter said, you know what he said? He said, where? Man, we got to get to this place. Now listen, we got to get to this place. Either you're a cultural Christian or you are born again. Here is the sound of a born again believer. As people are leaving and Jesus says, do you all want to go too? And Peter says, where would I go? I have nowhere to go. I have been places. I have lost it all. I have forsaken all to follow you. I have nowhere to go. I have been around a lot of people. I have done a lot of things. But you have the words of eternal life. We've got to get to a place. We've got to get to a place to say, I have nowhere else to go. Man's applause means nothing to me. I am not motivated by you coming or you going. I want to speak the truth. I want to live my life not pleasing to you, but pleasing to God. If by accident it makes you happy, well, aren't, aren't we good? Everything great. But I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to live holy. I'm here to make God happy. I'm here to please God. I want to live a life of, to, uh, that's pleasing to God. And if that means i got to say things that hurt your feelings, make you feel uncomfortable, get your butt real tight, make you feel like you need to walk out because you don't know where else to go, that's fine. I want to preach the truth. And I don't want you to be uh, believing this false sense of I'm okay if you're not the real thing. And you're not the real thing if you're not born again. We are not fit for the kingdom of God if we look back. The Bible says one who grabs hold of the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? Because see, you're going to have to do something with it, aren't you? I just said it. It's actually God's word. Now you've got to do something with it. Are you trying to plow a row by looking back? Are you surprised that your life is doing this? We've got to get like Peter and say, hey, I have nowhere else to go. Some of you think I'm a fool. Some of you came here today to appease somebody. I know. I know how that works. You came because somebody asked you to come. <laughs> Good, I told him to. <laughs> and you got here. You fell for it. But you think I'm a fool. I've lost my mind. This is crazy. These people sitting here. Oh, by the way, they think you're a fool too. If you believe this. Maybe I am. But what if I'm right? What if I'm right and you're wrong? I'm going to be okay. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. And you will spend eternity in hell. There is no such thing as purgatory. That sounds good, doesn't it? That eternal damnation is not really eternal. That, mm, it's sort of eternal. If you go to hell, you can be punished enough, then you get to go to heaven. 
And if people pray for you while you die, after you die, that they can somehow get you to heaven. No. I find it in God's word. I don't care what denomination says it. I don't care how long you've been Catholic. Well, you're not in the Catholic church today. You're in this church today. And it's a lie. And if they got to back it up with some false teaching, that's not in the Bible. It's heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. You have all the grace on this side of eternity. Well, everybody is going to go to heaven. Well, ain't that sweet? Don't that sound good? Once again, it's not biblical. There's a push now, a universalist thought where Jesus died for everybody. Everybody gets to go to heaven. I wish that was the truth because I got family members that died and went to hell. They'd be in heaven. That'd be great. Nobody wants to believe that more than me. I love heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want you to go to heaven. I love you. That would be great. It's just not true. It's not true. Jesus died for everyone, but you have to believe that he died for you and that he rose again for you or it benefits you nothing. He said, Lord, I got to get back. Lord, I ain't got nowhere to go. And you know, that's, I think I can confidently say that that's where I'm at in my life. Honey, I love you. But if you decide to pack your bags tomorrow, I'm going to be sad. And you're going to have a hard time doing it. <laughs> but if while I'm gone and you sneak out and I know nothing about it, I'm not turning my back on God. If I get here to this church tomorrow and y'all change the locks, and you're going to have a hard time doing that too. <laughs> but if you did, and you said, I don't want you to be the pastor of this church no more. Well, fine. I'm going to start a church right over there. <laughs> just over that canal right there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got off track. No, no, I'm not. That wasn't the point. Uh, no, I'm going to follow God. I'm not going to turn my back on him. Come hell, come high water. Difficulty, prosperity or loss. He has the words of eternal life. But you know what? It's, it's funny how we can say that and be there and then something happened. Oh, you got to watch out for sin. You got to watch out for the devil. Because see, even Peter who said, I have nowhere to go when Jesus was arrested they said, Peter, aren't you, aren't you with Jesus? They said, I don't, he, I don't know Jesus. Jesus who? Didn't you, aren't you a follower of him? Absolutely not. Three times he would deny Jesus. Jesus says, this building's going to be torn down in three days. I'm going to raise it up again. He forgets all of that. Where, where does Jesus find Peter? Doing his old thing. In his old life, fishing. See, it's easy uh, when we start compromising. Are you listening to me right now? Now I'm preaching. Compromising and giving in to say in the small areas of our lives becomes big problems. See, when we begin to compromise in the small things, you know what happens? We start trading the sacred for scraps. Amen. Just like the prodigal son. You remember the story? 
How many times have I said, talked about that story? He leaves his father's house. He spends his, all his money on sinful living, right? Gets to the place where he's burned all his bridges, spent all his money, has nowhere to go, and attaches himself as a servant, as a slave to a farmer who has hogs, and he's taking care of the hogs and the pigs, starving to death. He's hungry. And he kneels down about to eat from the, the scrap, from the trough of the hogs. When he comes to himself, wait a minute. What am I, what am I doing? Oh God, I pray we, somebody have that moment today. Oh, that somebody would have that what am I doing here? God has brought me out of a lot. He snatched me out of darkness. He bought me as a slave and made me a son. Why am I here? The Bible says he comes to himself. And you know what he says? He says, why am I here? What am I doing this for? In my father's house. Here, uh, here's, there is what? Bread. Bread, yeah. That was the part I was connecting. Bread. There's bread in my father's house. So much bread. He said that my servants eat this bread. When they sit, not the sons, the servants. My servants eat at the table and they eat this bread and there is so much bread that when they get up, they get the stuffed bread in their pockets, make them a to-go box, all these things, and take it home with them because there's plenty of bread. You hear what I'm saying? And here I am, his son, eating the scraps. And then he said, I know what I'll do. I'll get a speech together, Carl. I've preached this, right? Have you heard me say this before? You, you have, had not It doesn't get, it's still good, ain't it? He said, I'm going to, I'm going to prepare a speech. I know what I'll say. I'll say, uh, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Just make me a hired servant. That's what I'll do. He gets up. He goes to his father's house. He begins to say this, I, I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But listen, in the kingdom of God, there are no servants and sons. Jesus bought us as a servant to make us a son and a daughter, you see. There ain't no hired servants, all right? There's no middle class and upper class in the kingdom of God. You are a son and a daughter. Royal blood runs through your veins. His house is your house. <sighs> There's a table at his, a seat at his table with your name on it. He said, I know what I'll say. This is what I'll say. And he gets to the house and the father, Carnell, the father meets him on the road before he ever gets to the house. And here he goes. I'm no more worthy to be called your and love and grace of the father interrupts him. And he's no law. He doesn't even get to say what he planned on saying. And he's, the daddy said, help me out now. The daddy said, get me uh, a robe. Get me shoes to go on his feet. A robe to go on him. A ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf. In other words, he said, go into the deep freezer and get out that meat that we bought the other day. Cook it up. Why? Because we're about to have a party. We're about to celebrate that my son who was lost is now found. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I boring you? Am I making you tired and sleepy? Hang on, I'm almost over. It's almost over. He said, there's bread in my father's house. Have you been trading the sacred for scraps? Have you moved from the table of righteousness to the table of compromise and you've started eating from the table of complacency and the table of compromise? Not a bunch, not a, not a whole plate full, just a spoonful. That's just enough to make you sick. Just enough to make you sick. Remember what we talked about last week? Uh, 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 
How long will you halter between two opinions? Halt ye between two opinions. How long will you waver between two opinions? Let me ask you this. How long will you go from this table to that table, from this table to that table, from this table to that table, limping from this table to that table, from this table, and wondering why you are sick? Sin will make you sick. There is no room to compromise. There is no room to give in. I don't care what he says. I don't care what she says. I don't care what they say. I want to live a life that's pleasing to God. Hear this preacher. I've seen enough. I've heard enough. I've done been through enough to know enough to tell you that Jesus is enough. That there is nothing else that can, can do what Jesus can do. I have tasted and seen that my Lord is good. Let me save you some mistakes and some heartaches and some brokenness and some hurt. There's no need to go down that road. I know what that road leads to. It leads to death and destruction. Don't lay around with that one or this one. And don't lay around sin and don't think you're not going to get a STD, a sinfully spiritually transmitted disease because you will and you got to get to a place where you say I don't have no room for the devil. I don't have no more room for the world. I'm not hungry for the things of this world. I'm hungry from God. I have nowhere else to go. I'm not walking around this mountain no more. I'm moving forward in Jesus. Stand on across this building. No, I'm about to preach myself a stroke. Stand here. Stand, stand. I didn't say go home. Stand. Do you hear me? Do you hear? No, 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 no. Do you hear me? Do you him. Do you hear what God's saying? I've never felt it more urgently, more passionately than I do now. Who is Jesus to you? So two thoughts here is this. If you're not saved then you have got to get saved today. I don't know what else to say. If you are not saved today, you have got to get saved today. You do not have time to wait. Yesterday, it took, yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us. Any of us. Any of us, including me. I don't even know. He said, don't be so foolish in James. Don't be so foolish to think you know what's going to happen tomorrow. Or maybe that's Proverbs. I don't remember. But he said it. Don't even, don't think. Don't think. Are you foolish enough to think you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Because you don't. But today is the day of salvation. Today. Today. Right now. So if you're not saved, you got to get saved today. I know how, I know how you get saved. Believe on Jesus Believe, see and believe, see and believe, hear and believe, hear and trust. That's how you get saved. There ain't no paper signing. There ain't no baptism required. There's no credit check authorized. All you've got to do is believe on Jesus. Believe that he died for you and he rose again and want him, want him, want him, want him. That's what you got to do if you want to be saved. If you're, ain't, if you're not saved, you got to get saved today. You say, I can't believe you talk like that. I ain't never heard a preacher say you got to get saved today and do like that. But I'm telling you right now, this is what I'm telling you. The Bible says for us to compel, compel. I, could, I, I see people with more passion about Boston butts and about selling raffle tickets than I do about giving the eternal word of God to people and life and hope. No offense to Boston Butts, Jamie. They're good. <laughs> I forgot. What a Boston Butt man here. <laughs> anyway. So I'm compelling. You say, is this, you always act like this? Pretty much. <laughs> Preach like this, yes. I don't know when Jesus is going to come back. When that whole thing happens, I have no idea, Josh. But I know this. I am one step closer, one heartbeat closer, one breath closer, 
one thought closer to eternity than I was. And that's, that's done, Carl. I know that's going to happen. I know. I can, I can cut my calories down. I can cut my cholesterol down. I can get my blood sugar like it needs to be or whatever. I can do all those things and exercise every day. But I am still going to step into eternity. I can't put it off. In fact, the Bible says our days is already numbered. He already knows. He's got it. He's got the checkout day for us. We just don't know when it is. But it's going to happen. Once appointed man to die and then the judgment. Caleb didn't say that. God said it. Once appointed man to die, it's going to happen. And then the judgment. And then there we are. You can't get me on the phone. You can't get mom on the phone. You won't be able to get daddy on the phone. You will be standing before God. Bryce, is that, is that, is that sobering to you? Like, does that mean, it is me. And for some of us, it probably scares us. And it should. And I hope that it scares the hell out of you. I hope it does. I hope it does. I hope it scares you enough for you to say yes to Jesus. Because see, now, now listen. I don't fear it. Look at me. Listen to me. Look at me. I don't fear it. Because perfect love cast out all fear. That I can stand before God and I'm waiting for the day. I never thought I'd get to the place in my life where I long for the day. I never thought that would be possible. I never thought it would be possible. Here I am. Longing for the day. I heard people talk about it and say it, but I guess I had too much of the world in me. Too many plans for me. But here I am. I'm an old man. I sound like an old man. <laughs> I long for the day to stand in the presence of Jesus. I used to be scared because I thought it was, oh, it was too much of me. But now I realize it's got to be all Him. perfect love cast out all fear if you don't have this peace if you if you can't answer like Peter would answer Jesus asked Peter by the way in a later on who do men say that I am and some of the disciples said well some say you're John the Baptist some say you're Elijah some say you're the prophets of old maybe Jeremiah but Jesus said but who do you say that I am and Peter said mm, hey me I, I got it Peter I say that you are the Christ the son of the living God Jesus said, what did you say? He said, I say that you're Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. This is something that has been revealed to you by my Father, by the Spirit of God. And he said, upon that rock, upon that foundational truth, upon that statement, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who is Jesus in your life? Here's two altar calls. Yeah, we're going to do an altar call. Here it goes right now. Ready? If you're not saved, it's time to get saved. Today's the day of salvation. I'm not doing hand uh, about. We got team? Team, hold on to your cards because I'm not doing that thing today. I'm not doing the bow your head, close your eyes, raise your hand. Hold them off till next week. I'm saying run for your life today. I'm saying if you don't know Jesus today, run for your life. Come on. Oh, Jesus.
going to get saved today? You're daggum right you did. Amen. 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 You got to come to get saved today? Amen. 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 Who else? Who else? Who else? You better not wait. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Today is the day of salvation. Not raising hands, not closing eyes. We're saying yes to Jesus. You know, Jesus made it easy. Believe in me. Come to me. A step. My, my baby boy can take a step. That's what this is. A step. <laughs> That's why I said, don't, don't keep the children away from me. In fact, be like the children. Be like the children. Take a step to me. Anybody else want to take a step? You, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Lift your hands right now. Oh, bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. Oh, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Two keys up, two keys up. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Okay. You won't be bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. You won't leave here. You don't have to like you came in Jesus' name. Now, 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 y'all going to get saved. In fact, you probably already are because you just took a step. God's doing it. We're just going to pray in just a minute. But let me tell you, now, this is hard. Some of you have been eating from the table of compromise and it's made you sick and you're ready to repent. You're ready to repent and you don't care what people say or what people think. I'm asking you to come on right here to this front right now. It's making you sick. You've been complacent. Hey, I've done this at 11 o'clock service. I said, there ain't no way nobody's going to come. Too prideful to do this. But I'm telling you, if you don't, come on. If you, you say, I, I got to get this out of me. I gotta confess. Come on. I gotta confess. I gotta get some stuff out. I've been, I've been at the, I've been at the trough. I've been at the trough. Come on, 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 come on. I've been at the trough eating scraps. Come on. Talk to Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? You've been dining at compromise and complacency. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now lift your hands all across this building right now. This, I want you to pray for these, and I want you to pray for these. Are you ready to get saved? Say, Jesus, say, Jesus. Say, I need you. I've tried it all, and it don't work. Change my life. Set me free. I'm tired of living this way. The hurt, the shame, the brokenness, I lay it at your feet. I place my faith and trust in you. You are my God. Ellie, you are my God. You are my God. You are my King. I need you. I turn away from sin and I turn my eyes towards you. Today, I'm changed. I'm saved. I'm a new person. I, I receive your grace, your love, and your mercy. Today, I'm saved. I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know what? Come on. Well,